Jim Jones was a preacher who promised his followers heaven on earth. Instead, in a jungle in South America, he gave them death. Jim had the deepest, darkest eyes, and if you would watch him and listen to him, he could convince you of a lot of things. He had a strange power. He felt power. He saw how the people worshipped him, and he just simply believed that he was, quote, God, unquote. The most important thing to Jim Jones was that his name go down in history as a socialist revolutionary. He was consumed by a sense of outrage at the injustices that he saw. I think that that propelled him, in a sense, into madness, in a sense, into corruption. There is no question that Jim Jones will have a place in Western history, whether we like it or not. In the spring of 1931, the Great Depression was at its height. Across the United States, people were out of work and struggling to survive. Industry had failed in the big cities, and many farms had been foreclosed and deserted in the Midwest. In the 1920s, James and Lynetta Jones had owned a small farm in Crete, Indiana. But when the Depression started, they lost their land because they could not pay the mortgage. Without the farm, and because of her husband's disability from World War I, Lynetta went to work full-time at local canneries and factories near Crete. She had become the family's sole breadwinner. On May 13, 1931, in this two-story house in Crete, a black-haired baby boy was born to Lynetta and James. They named their son James Warren Jones. James Warren Jones would be their only child, and from the day he was born, his life would never be easy. His father had only a grade school education. Before going off to fight in the First World War, he had worked as a laborer building roads. Unfortunately, he had returned home from France with his lungs badly scarred by searing mustard gas. He collected government checks for his disability and rarely, if ever, worked again. I remember him walking up to the post office in the middle of town and going in and just leaning on the counter there and just coughing and coughing and coughing. He, he just couldn't go any farther. Where Jim's father was sick and weak, his mother was a strong and determined woman who rarely smiled. Perhaps not a happy individual, but a strong individual. She worked to work early. She got home late. I'm sure she was tired. And then she had things to do. And she didn't like the whole environment, but she didn't have much of recourse. So she endured, but she, in my opinion, made everybody else pretty uncomfortable. In 1934, the Jones family moved three miles up the road to the small, quiet town of Lynn, Indiana, about 80 miles east of Indianapolis. The Jones' new home was in the poor section next to the railroad tracks. I remember going in the living room and I think there was one chair and one couch, uh, one bulb hanging from a wire in the middle of the room. Uh, I don't remember any curtains at all. It was just a very, very bare uh, place, you see. Just a very bare uh, existence. Jim was a lively boy of high intelligence, but almost from the day he was born, he had no love, affection, or warmth at home. I never remember any of them ever touching or really having a good serious talk together or doing anything together. As a youngster, Jim often wandered the streets of Lynn, alone and without supervision. Fortunately, he came under the wing of a next door neighbor, Mrs. Myrtle Kennedy, a devout church-going woman. She became his surrogate mother and introduced the young Jim Jones to church. In church, he found the warmth and love that had been missing in his cold, indifferent home. We had what we called the Holy Roller Church out in the west end of town. It was where they shouted and ran up and down the aisles and got caught up in the spirit and it would get pretty wild sometimes. By the time Jim was 10, he was conducting his own church services in front of boys and girls in the neighborhood. There was a barn behind his house, and I can remember hearing him preaching up there and yelling up there, and uh, he preached uh, funeral services for dogs and cats and birds. Uh, uh, he had revival meetings for 
other, he, he'd get some of the younger kids to come up and listen to him. If he was successful in getting a, a group four or five or more, he, he did not want you to go home. I remember several occasions where he said, no, you can't leave. And he locked me in the loft one night. Young Jim never played any of the normal childhood games with the other kids in the neighborhood. From his earliest childhood, Jim Jones, as reported by the people who lived and grew up with him, had an extraordinary skill in getting people to do what he wanted to do. He was fascinated by that, and he often exercised that skill uh, as somebody else might exercise an athletic skill or a particular type of memory skill. And as time went on, he became better and better at it. As a youngster, Jim knew that he was different. He spent time by himself in the library, reading about socialism, Gandhi, Karl Marx, and communism. Though he was full of mischief, he had good grades in school. Still, every now and then, he'd show a side that gave hints of dark things to come. He would be so stern normally, but when he'd done something off color, he would have a smirk. And he'd done me four or five things. He locked me in the attic a couple of times. He shot me with a BB gun a couple of times. And each time when I turned around and looked at him as to why, he had that look on his face. And it was a really a strange look. In the fall of 1948, his mother had left his father for another man when Jim was only 16. They moved to nearby Richmond. Jim still did not have much family life, and religion took the place of what he did not have at home. He was seen carrying his Bible everywhere in the poor and black neighborhoods of Richmond where he preached on street corners. His theme, racial equality. Blacks were surprised to hear those words from a white teenager and they accepted him at his word. At times he drew crowds of 25 to 30 people and he started honing what would become the formidable skills of a preacher. Jim needed money to live and he worked as an orderly at Reed Memorial Hospital in Richmond. Excellent worker for the hospital. The hospital just thought he was tops. But some of Jim's co-workers thought otherwise and witnessed an unpleasant side to his personality. He had asked me to dry shave a man in traction and I got all the paraphernalia I needed and started to lather his face and Jim got irate and he grabbed the bowl and he grabbed the knife and he said, I do not mean like that. He said, I'll show you what I mean. And he took the razor and started scraping that man's face. And tears just ran down that man's face. And he, he, was, in, he was in pain. And Jim turned around and gave me that look. And within a week, I was gone. At the hospital, he met Marceline Baldwin, a nurse in training. She was from a very religious family and four years his senior. She was an outstanding nurse. And uh, I, my wife would come home and would say uh, something about how compassionate Marcy is and, and uh, how good it is to work with her. She was just an outstanding person. Marceline's parents did not like her being involved with a man four years her junior, but Jim pursued her anyway. Soon he won her parents over and they set a date for the wedding. Jim graduated early from Richmond High School with honors in the winter of 1948. At 17, he entered Indiana University in Bloomington. Six months later, in June 1949, in Richmond's Trinity United Methodist Church, the 18-year-old Jim Jones married the 22-year-old Marceline Baldwin. It was a double ceremony shared with Marceline's sister. Marceline continued to work as a nurse while Jim attended classes their period of adjustment was a difficult one. Jim was often mentally abusive to Marceline, criticizing her for being too religious. Despite his taunts against Marceline, Jim himself continued to find solace in the Bible. But he was starting to believe that social justice in whatever form was far more important to him than his belief in God. In 1950, 19-year-old Jim Jones was married, struggling to survive, and in his second year at Indiana University. Although he rarely attended classes, he read extensively in history and the social sciences. Everyone from Eleanor Roosevelt to Stalin caught his attention, and he began to tell people that Soviet-style communism was best for everyone. 
Jim and Marcelin moved to Indianapolis in 1951 to continue his studies at the downtown campus of Indiana University. At this point, he had no idea what he wanted to do with his life, even flirting with a career in law. When he was 21, he began to believe the Methodist Church promoted social justice. After much thought, he decided to become a minister. He took a position as a student pastor at the Somerset Southside Methodist Church in a poor white neighborhood of Indianapolis. He was paid very little money, and he and Marcelin had to struggle to make ends meet. One way was an odd job, a very odd job. Jim imported monkeys from South America and then sold them door to door. He bought monkeys and sold them. That was his means of finances and he had a great tenderness in his heart for animals, monkeys, dogs, or whatever. He just loved animals. In church, the young minister in training had a natural preaching style that soon gained the notice of the religious community. My husband had heard about him, and we went to hear him uh, preach and were quite fascinated by him. Um, he was... Um, a very handsome, articulate, um, almost um, charismatic personality. But the Methodist Church was not flexible enough for the socially conscious young minister. So he went looking for alternatives. He attended revival meetings and witnessed tent shows. Now, when Jim stepped up to the pulpit, he impressed worshipers with his newfound skills. He was quite eloquent used a lot of repetition, a lot of um, uh, drama, and had a good voice, good speaking voice, and uh, it was very persuasive. People simply um, flocked to him. Only 23 in 1954, Jim Jones created his first church in a racially mixed neighborhood. He called it Community Unity. As a teenager, he had preached to blacks and felt accepted by them. He went into the black areas of Indianapolis and, and brought them in. Uh, and he was the type of a speaker who would a appeal to the person who was wanting something uh, that they never had before in their life, something new, something different. In his new church, Jim Jones started to practice healings, the dramatic laying on of hands to cure people's ills. Parishioners believed in his power and would leave the church feeling cured. He openly sought new members through his practice of healing but even his friends did not believe he had such powerful talents. We talked to Jim about the healing several times. We questioned him. We thought they were setups. And once in a while, he would admit it. The end justified the means as far as he was concerned. This was an individual who from very early age was fascinated with his ability to manipulate people. And it was almost like a kind of pragmatic, I'll go this way and see how this works, how far I can push this person in this direction, rather than the fulfillment of a thoroughly worked out theology or an ideology. In 1956, Jones borrowed money for a down payment on a real church with stained glass windows and a peaked roof. It was in a racially mixed neighborhood, and he called his new ministry Wings of Deliverance. Soon, he changed the church's name to People's Temple. Jones christened People's Temple a movement, and he began to foster a cult of personality, his own. His congregation was growing, and the more established he became, the more he preached a gospel of socialism and racial equality. In fact, he found himself believing less and less in God. He said, basically, he was an agnostic, but that he had found that these people responded to this and he had all of this concern for um, um, poverty, um, for the oppressed, and he could get these people to do almost anything that he wanted them to do to help these people. Whatever his motives, Jim Jones was true to his word about helping the needy. He established soup kitchens and he clothed the poor. There were whites and some Hispanics in the People's Temple, and many blacks, the way it would always be throughout its brief history. He talked about the integration of the church. He always seemed to be very much for the downtrodden and very much for the black man. <laughs>
When Jones was 28 and Marshall and 32, they had their only biological child, a son. In a nod to one of his heroes, he named the boy Stephen Gandhi Jones. Soon after, he and Marceline became the first white family in Indianapolis to adopt a black child, a boy they named James Warren Jones, Jr. He also adopted several Korean children. With an eye to publicity, Jones dubbed his household the Rainbow Family. Jones then seized an opportunity to put his words into action. In 1960, there was an opening in Indianapolis on the Human Rights Commission. He applied for the job and got it. Jones took his new post seriously and helped to desegregate seating in restaurants and movie theaters and to open jobs for minorities in hospitals and on the police force. Along the way, he made enemies of segregationists and right-wingers. Oh, I'm sure there were people who couldn't stand him. But by and large, um, he was admired and respected. He was still quite rational and did just a lot of good. But a new bizarre fear was gnawing away at Jones. He began to believe the end of the world was near. In 1962, he read an article in Esquire magazine that listed the nine safest places to be in the event of a nuclear attack. Coupled with the pressures of running his flourishing church and the attacks against him for his stand on civil rights, he decided he had to move his family more than 5,000 miles from Indianapolis to Belo Horizonte, Brazil, a city near Rio de Janeiro. People's Temple sent him money to live as he struggled to find the right direction for himself and his church. Meanwhile, People's Temple was in danger of going under. Without his leadership, membership had dropped to below 100. There were frantic calls for him to come home. Despite his fear of returning, he had no choice. And two years later, in early 1964, he returned to Indianapolis. Though down, he was not yet out. His calls for social justice were stronger than ever, and some saw him as a prophet. He was becoming a little too impressed by his own power. He thought he was God. This was what happened to him. He got too much adulation, too much attention and he couldn't handle it. Probably because of the increased adulation, Jones's paranoia was on the rise. He now wrongly believed the IRS had him under investigation. His growing fear of a nuclear holocaust ate away at him. In reality, he was under constant attack from racists and conservatives, so he was more desperate than ever to find a safe haven for his church and his family far from Indianapolis. By 1964, he discovered the ideal spot, Redwood Valley, California, 100 miles north of San Francisco. In the summer of 1965, Jones gathered his small flock of 140 loyal souls, and together, they migrated across the country. Redwood Valley was a friendly place with good climate, plentiful jobs, and beneficial welfare. He established a commune with housing for his followers, and he opened nursing homes for the aging. His integrated church attracted many middle-class whites who believed in his gospel of socialism. People's Temple offered people hope to change their lives in a radical way, um, in a way that society was not changing. You haven't been in love for a month been too busy. We have about every uh, level of society, all socioeconomic income straight in, professional down to the ordinary field worker, field labor. I was deeply moved by his uh, persuasive manner and his uh, charisma. There was a person, in the person of Jim, who showed such concern, such tenderness and love for children and for animals. I was overwhelmed. To assist him in the running of the People's Temple, Jones created the Planning Commission, made up of his most devoted followers. Many were women who were crucial to running his movement. Women in particular rose uh, through the ranks in People's Temple to positions of great responsibility. 
Um, there was no glass ceiling in people's temple. So very young women, women in their 20s and 30s, were in control of millions of dollars of assets. They were in control of making a variety of decisions, which in corporate America they would not have ever. Whether it was power the person was interested in, whether it was sexuality, whatever it was that was the person's weakness, he would attempt to place that person in a gratification point that they knew they couldn't duplicate in the outside world. By 1969, either out of his own desire or as a means of control, Jones embraced free love and free sex in his church. It was an unwritten rule. He could demand sex from any woman or man in the congregation whenever he wanted it. He used personal charisma and sexual authority over both women and men, but particularly women, I think that he felt he could uh, tie them to him, both uh, kind of organizationally and also romantically. He would say, I want every person in this room who has had sex with me to stand up. And maybe a couple of people would be really shy and they'd sit down. He says, now I want everybody, and he'd point to the person, I want you to stand up and, and admit to this. And so everybody in the room who had had sex with him would have to stand up. It was all about building Jim's power. He even went one step further. While still married to Marceline, he took a mistress, the first of many. She was a married woman named Carolyn Moore Layton. There was a real negative feeling that this isn't right. Here's a pastor, and uh, my understanding of pastors was that they did not have an <laughs> that kind of relationship with parishioners. But Jones was hardly the average pastor. When still a college freshman, he had questioned the existence of God. Now, with a dedicated following, he was openly denying the existence of a supreme being. More ominously, he even began to call himself God. With that idea firmly in mind, Jones now worked harder than ever to build his movement by recruiting heavily in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Perhaps because what he and People's Temple offered was so unusual, he met with success. There's no question that a part of the way in which uh, the People's Temple was able to retain people is that it was the best drama in town. It provided not only some social worth, for if that happened to be your interest, or if your interest happened to be drama, it provided drama. Jones was now obsessed with building his movement. Believing he needed more energy to support his frenetic pace, Jones started injecting amphetamines, speed. The drug did give him more stamina, and he did not seem to care about its addictive consequences or its tendency to build paranoia. Soon, Jim Jones would be on the move once again, this time to the fertile, greener pastures of San Francisco. With the move of People's Temple headquarters to San Francisco in 1972, Jim Jones and his church were on the verge of something new. Jones was an opportunist. He saw a way to build his influence by going public and entering local politics. So he ordered members of People's Temple to work in election campaigns and demonstrate for social causes. Jones' payoff came in 1976, when San Francisco Mayor George Moscone named him chairman of the Housing Authority. Jim really enjoyed the adulation and the popularity and the fame that moving to San Francisco brought him because there he could rub shoulders with San Francisco politicians, with uh, people from all over the country, from national political leaders. So he really enjoyed uh, kind of playing with the big boys. In public, Jones cultivated the look of a social activist. In private, inside the confines of People's Temple, he was a tyrant. He controlled his congregation with what he called public humiliation and catharsis sessions. These had started in Redwood Valley, and they would continue through the life of the movement. The church justified those actions by saying that they were dealing with uh, hardcore social misfits, and that rather than turn people over to the police to be put in prison or jail, they chose to deal with those problems in their own way within their organization. Yet his congregation remained devoted to him. The elderly were his most loyal parishioners. They signed their social security and pension checks over to People's Temple. Some even gave their homes and savings to the church because it offered a promise of a better life. As the coffers of the People's Temple grew, so did Jones hold over his followers. But his entry into the world only seemed to intensify his paranoia. 
we quickly discovered the secrecy and the paranoia, which was a part of Jim and a part of People's Temple. People's Temple had its secrets, and they, uh, they were very suspicious of anybody who tried to find out about those secrets, and they always felt that there was a conspiracy. In spite of their public work, People's Temple was still somewhat isolated. Outsiders had no idea what went on behind closed doors. That would soon change because everywhere Jones went, hundreds of his followers trailed behind him. Curious reporters couldn't help but notice. He'd bring all of these people in, and he himself would come in in the midst uh, of a smaller uh, a retinue of, uh, of aides. They'd uh, shoo him to the front of the, of the room, put him on uh, the center of the chair, and, and basically sort of guard him the whole time. Guys in dark glasses, black suits, the whole thing, it was very unusual. Kilduff was suspicious of Jim Jones and what he called his big public blitz, so he started investigating People's Temple. The church didn't want any of this. The folks said, oh, Jim Jones likes to work sort of low key. Uh, the reverend doesn't want to at this time appear to sort of crowd the center stage and take credit from anyone else. And there was all this aw shucks kind of shy attitude about the whole thing, and it, it didn't ring right. But Kilduff's editors at the San Francisco Chronicle killed the story, claiming it was old news. Kilduff now pursued the story for New West magazine. Soon, there were pressures on him to stop. I kept getting all these calls late at night at home and at funny times at the office saying, you know, you really shouldn't be writing too much about this guy. He's doing the Lord's work. And I just began to feel that this thing really wasn't being dealt with or, or spoken to me straight. In his investigation, Kilduff discovered a problem for People's Temple that Jim Jones could not control. Defectors, men and women who had left the movement and were talking about what took place inside the church. We had guards constantly around the church. We were constantly watching when we'd go to school or whatever. Hey, we were so af we were afraid to t we were afraid, afraid to talk to our own parents because when we did, we were turned in for being uh, negative. Things got bad gradually. First, they started whippings with a uh, belt, a few whacks, and uh, for minor infractions such as drinking and smoking or, or being late for work. Then they went to the board and. My daughter received 75 whacks with his board. When she went to school and dressed down for gym, the girl said her butt looked like hamburger. Anyone contemplating leaving the church was deathly afraid of the consequences. In making a decision to leave people's temple, you have to decide you'd rather die than go back because they threatened to kill all, all traitors. Uh, when we left, we had all kinds of threatening phone calls, threatening letters. Defections fueled Jones' paranoia. He said the police and government were interfering in their lives, and he would go to extremes to protect his flock. He would say that, okay, now, if the people, the government officials or whatever, were to come in here and try to um, destroy us or take us or try to expose me or us, then we would kill ourselves so no one would live to tell the story of the things that happened. Jones even started testing the will of his parishioners by convincing them they had committed mass suicide. I'd gone through a false uh, mass suicide. I, I went through one talk and I went through one where we actually took a drink and we were told we had an hour to live so that Jones could find out how people would react psychologically. Now, with his fear of curious outsiders and his general paranoia ratcheting ever higher, Jones looked for an escape to someplace far from prying eyes. He found it in a tiny backwards country at the northern end of South America, Guyana. He sent an advance team to clear and develop a site for People's Temple's new home. It would be called simply Jonestown. In 1974, in the dense jungle 140 miles from Georgetown, the capital of Guyana, Jim Jones' small advance guard cleared the land, planted crops, and built homes paving the way for the mass migration to come. They thought that they were pioneers and they were going to do something that would make a difference. They were going to create a better world, a better life for their families and themselves. And so there was a lot of uh, sense of high adventure. From Jonestown, the advance guard sent encouraging messages back to the People's Temple about Jim Jones the man they called Father. Hello, family. It's such a joy and great pleasure being here because of Father's love we are trying to make, and we are making a place of refuge for all of you here. Back in San Francisco, the majority of his followers were increasingly subjected to Jim Jones' growing paranoia. When you first came to People's Temple, you had no idea what was really happening with Jim Jones. 
He kept all his little insanities undercover. I really don't feel comfortable with our worship being photographed. I really don't. I don't feel as secretive as Jones was, his every move now came under the critical eye of the press. More ex-members had come forward to describe the secrets of Jones's church. In August 1977, a magazine article appeared exposing People's Temple. Feeling under siege, a beleaguered Jim Jones started sending his parishioners in small groups to Guyana. For some, it was simply freedom from worry and want. For others, it was a genuine socialist experiment. Most of the people who were part of People's Temple who went to Guyana had no independent financial resources. Their finances and their futures were tied up in People's Temple, and so in one sense, they had to go. In another sense, however, they wanted to go. They saw Jonestown as the promised land. Early on in Jonestown, the pioneers appeared to be happy. They were certainly dedicated to Jones and their new life. Jonestown has turned into an absolute village. Really, you have a heaven across the sea waiting for you. When fascist terror brings concentration camps, you have a home. These lovely people are all happy. None of them want to return. They're delighted with this lovely life. In their first months in Guyana, life was still an adventure for these mostly former city dwellers. Creating a utopia from the jungle was more difficult than they imagined lived in cramped quarters and worked long hours. Their day did not end until Jones held his all-night meetings. He sat on a specially built throne in the commune's central pavilion. There, the beatings and public humiliations continued. If you would say something, he would have your whole family come in and beat you, you know. It's like they would beat you. And they would have to do it because if they didn't do it, then he would punch them, you know. To keep control over his movement, Jones created a new mind game that he called the White Knight. It was faked mass suicide, in which Jones convinced his followers they were under siege. White Knight essentially was a series of rehearsals that were designed to deal with an ultimate suicidal end. So if one was hounded by society and eventually unable to fulfill utopia, people would join together in a uh, symbolic mass suicide, at least in the belief of many. In December 1977, Jim Jones' mother, Lynetta, died in Jonestown from lung disease. As he openly grieved her death, his health deteriorated. It became apparent to Jones' son, Stephen, that his father's drug use increased and he was out of control. It was obvious to me that he was using drugs. I was trying to convince my mother just to wait it out because I knew that my father didn't have too much more time. He was killing himself slowly, and that sounds callous. My mother was always trying to say, we've got to uh, isolate him and keep him away from drugs. I says, this man thinks he's God, mother. You don't tell God to get in the house, and you're he's not coming out. You just don't handle it that way. Jim Jones' goal in Guyana had been to keep his movement out of the limelight, but that became more difficult. He was under growing attack by an organization of defectors and family members known as Concerned Relatives. I think that Jim Jones uh, uh, took his group down there because he was afraid to face the publicity and answer the questions uh, here in this country. I think the only way he can survive and sustain what he started is to isolate all his followers from this country and from their families. In the early 1970s, two of Concerned Relatives leaders were Grace and Tim Stone, once among Jones's closest advisors. They were parents of a son, John Victor. For reasons that remain unclear, in February 1972, Tim Stone signed an unusual document behind his wife's back. It said Jim Jones was John Victor's real father because Stone could not, in his words, sire children. In time, Tim Stone repudiated the document and said John Victor was his son. Tim and Grace Stone spent years trying to get their son back with no success. In 1978, Concerned relatives appealed to activist California Congressman Leo Ryan to investigate People's Temple. He agreed, and on November 15, 1978, he departed for Guyana from San Francisco with TV and newspaper reporters and members of concerned relatives. I'd like for my relatives to tell me face to face that they're happy in a jungle. And uh, I'd like for, for Jim Jones, the Reverend Jones himself, to tell me uh, that my relatives don't want to speak to me. 
After waiting a couple of days, Jim Jones finally allowed Congressman Ryan and his party to visit Jonestown. At the settlement, they were entertained, and the delegation had a meeting with Jim Jones. Ryan made it clear that he was only on a fact-finding mission. I think that all of you know that I'm here to find out more about uh, questions that have been raised about your operation here. But I can tell you right now that from the few conversations I've had with some of the folks here already this evening, that uh, whatever the comments are, there are some people here who believe that this is the best thing that ever happened to them in their whole life. Most of Jones' followers said they were happy. But when Ryan and his team returned to Jonestown on November 18th for one more visit, a few slipped notes to the television crew saying they wished to escape. Jones was upset when he learned 15 of his followers had turned on him and would return to America with Leo Ryan. People was... play games, friend. They lie, they lie. What can I do about liars? Are you people going to leave us? I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. I mean, he was ready to, to snap. I know that now. I know that, that anything could have pushed him over the edge. And they had no way of knowing that. When they were leaving, Ryan was attacked by a disciple of Jim Jones, but he was uninjured. Soon, he, his team, and the defectors were at the Port Kaituma airstrip ready to fly home. Their departure was too much for Jones to bear. An armed squad from People's Temple arrived at the airstrip on a tractor as Ryan and his party were boarding the planes. They didn't hear pull up because the engine, the one engine was on on the plane. And I was, in the meantime, I was trying to hurry and get people on it because I saw the tractor coming to the edge of the runway. It drove up. It didn't worry me any because I knew the ones on it. And here the men were hid. And they stood up and started shooting. You know, their guns just up and down that plane like that. When the firing started, I had my back turned. And I turned around and it, I saw a <laughs> congressman, uh, Don Harris, Bob Brown. I saw them fall immediately. I started screaming. Uh, looked back and saw my daughter-in-law's top of her head blown off. Edith Park's daughter-in-law was dead, as were Congressman Leo Ryan and three others. Ten were wounded. Survivors ran as quickly as they could into the safety of the jungle. It was getting dark when the gunmen started back to Jonestown, where they would report to Jim Jones. Before the sun set in Jonestown, dying of another sort would begin. It would be a shocking act that the world would not soon forget. It was November 18, 1978, and Congressman Leo Ryan lay dead at an airstrip outside Jonestown. Back in Jonestown, Jim Jones had gathered his followers around him, and preparations to end everyone's life were underway. They brought over syringes, large sized syringes, you know, minus the needles. And they had uh, small uh, plastic containers with a uh, liquid solution in it and a large vat of uh, what appeared to be punch. At 6 p.m., more than an hour later, the killers returned and told Jones that Leo Ryan was dead. He knew outside forces would soon move in on his besieged kingdom. From his throne in the center of Jonestown, he ordered the suicides to begin. There would be no more white knights. They invaded our privacy. They came into our home. They found us 6,000 miles away. Mary Brigade killed them justice. The congressman is dead. Please get us some medication. It's simple. It's simple. There's no convulsion with it. It's just simple. Just please get it before it's too late. They would uh, draw up an amount in the syringes. And he had babies and children go first. Then they would swallow it and then give them a small drink of punch to wash it down. The will is the will of sovereign being that this happened to us. Now we lay down our lives in protest against what's been done. Parents were talking to their children and a lot of the children were crying. He was telling them not to tell the children that they were dying, not to tell them it was painful, and that people had to die with dignity. Die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. He sounded very calm. He didn't seem excited. He was very calm. It is not to be feared. It's a friend. It's a friend. You're sitting there. Show your love for one another. Let's get calm. Let's get calm. The people were standing around in groups, uh, saying goodbye to each other, uh, walking around hugging old friends and stuff like that. <laughs> Children were crying, they were going through convulsions, and 
some of the grandparents uh, and parents were, you know, getting hysterical as they saw the children die. But basically, a lot of the people were sitting, uh, especially the senior people, were just sitting and just waiting or watching. Be patient, be patient. I tell you, I don't care how many screams you hear, I don't care how many anguish cries, death is a million times preferable to 10 more days of this life. The children died first, many in the arms of their parents or other adults. Then the adults followed, often lying down or falling on top of the children. Soon, it was over. The next morning, the Guyanese government sent troops to Jonestown. The first reporters on the scene were shocked by what they saw. As we came in by helicopter, um, it, it looked as if someone had dumped a, a bunch of colored paper on the ground because these people were all lying there with red and yellow and white shirts and sweaters on. And from the air, it almost looked as if it was simply the, the end of a carnival sort of thing. When we got on the ground, the bodies, uh, as you walked up, were, were bunched together, many of them with their arms still around each other. It, it was an awful, eerie kind of feeling to, to see all of this. First reports undercounted the number of dead. As government officials sorted and totaled the bodies, the number increased to over 900. Close to 300 were children. They found Jim Jones with a fatal bullet wound behind his temple. It will never be known whether it was self-inflicted or, as has been speculated, he was killed by one of his followers. It is believed he never drank the poisoned punch. There were very few survivors. Among the dead, Jones' wife Marceline, his two mistresses, and six-year-old John Victor Stone. 248 bodies were never claimed, and they now rest in a common grave in an Oakland, California cemetery. A small tablet reads, in memory of the victims of the Jonestown tragedy. To this day, it is impossible to know what really drove more than 900 people to commit suicide. The primary thing that you see with violent cult leaders is that they will never give up control. They are never going to be in a position in which they abdicate, resign. They would rather go forward into a violent confrontation with society, as occurred in Waco, or into a mass suicide, as it occurred in Jonestown. It's difficult to understand what his goal really was. I don't think it was personal fame and fortune. Um, certainly he did not live a higher lifestyle from those of his members. His goal may have been to create a name for himself. Initially it may have been to create a better society for Americans. But in the end, I think that his goal was release from his personal pain and anguish over his own life. I don't know whether he will ever be remembered for anything but those final days. I'm afraid they wiped out everything else, which is so sad. It is so sad. Each year, survivors and relatives of Jonestown and People's Temple gather at the mass grave in Oakland to pay their respects. They ask how and why did the tragedy happen, but there are no satisfactory answers. The only certain thing is that People's Temple barely lasted beyond Jonestown. Today, it no longer exists, except as a memory of what it was, rather than what it could have been.